What? Um, I'm about to hit you in the head with a peanut butter sandwich. Identity as a performance is a popular understanding of how the self is formed. Irvin Goffman once said, the cultural values of an establishment will determine in detail how the participants are to feel about many matters, and at the same time establish a framework of appearances that must be maintained, whether or not there is feeling behind the appearances. And this is the central tension that Black Widow's entire journey is concentrated on. The dreams and needs of constructing an identity that may not completely correspond but projects a wealth of hopes. And more than any other character, Nat has one of the most fascinatingly complex arcs because by being a supporting character during the entire Infinity Saga, her whole story is able to profit off of the reflections from the other characters in their arcs. And as a result, she's also able to breathe a bit more. In order to organise this essay, I'm going to use Joseph Campbell's monomyth structure for the, what, sixth bloody time? Because Black Widow's journey is incredibly fragmented. Unlike Steve and Tony's arc, each phase doesn't tidily correspond with each act. Instead, her seven-film journey functions almost like a form of connective tissue between each phase. Oh, it's alright, you just make something up. What, like you? I don't know, the truth is a matter of circumstance. It's not all things to all people, all the time. Neither am I. It's a tough way to live. Not leaving the familiar to venture into the unknown doesn't happen in phase one, but at the start of phase two. And her becoming the master of two worlds doesn't happen until the start of phase three. So this analysis will primarily focus on how Black Widow's identity moves out of different domains, and more importantly, how it's realized by various connections. <laughs> You here to do your laundry? Where's your other friend? Oh, I want to take it back. No, 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 you can't retract it. I didn't realize you were waiting. I would have joined you, but uh, no. I got red in my ledger. I'd like to wipe it out. Watch the word. I got it. I got it. Nat's introduction in Iron Man 2 is kind of like a prologue. It's an appearance that isn't wholly necessary for the grand scheme of things, but it establishes the core values of the characters and where her home is. Very impressive individual. So She's fluent in French, know. Italian, Russian, Latin. Who speaks Latin? No one speaks Latin, no it's a dead Latin. language. She's Tony's new assistant, and at first it seems like she's going to be engaged in a love triangle between Tony and Pepper, but this is subverted when instead it's revealed that she was a shield plant this whole time, used to watch over Tony and evaluate if he's suitable for the Avengers. So she's defined not by her emotional connections, but by a professional one. Therefore, even though Black Widow was just a supporting character, her storytelling purposes in representing a wider context, a world of deception and unforeseen judgments. Now this, on the other hand, is Agent Romanoff's assessment of you. It's actually a fun metatextual way to establish her own in-universe internal ball of ideas and tensions. She herself is deceptive and is constantly burdened with a very heavy, precarious self-image that is purely sustainable from the judgement of others, because it's all a performance. A quiet moment that highlights this is when Natasha is at Tony's birthday. I should cancel the party, huh? Probably. Yeah, because it's, um... Ill-timed. Right, sends the wrong message. Inappropriate. It's a deeply flirtatious scene where she clearly has his entire personality mapped out enough to finish all of his sentences, but on the other hand, there's something deeply cold about this exchange. It lacks a sense of intimacy. I, I gotta say it, it's hard to get a read on you. Where are you from? Legal. Because he can't map her out, it's an interaction that is completely one way. For Natasha, she can give a flattering social performance, but it's one that's constructed to omit much of herself. 
Her character is almost like a mini metaphor for Charles Cooley's looking glass theory, where self-identity is specifically defined not by how you see yourself, but how you think others see you. And that's effectively Nat's character. Her identity is completely dependent on how it's socially reflected. So entering into the Avengers, this is expanded upon by her introduction. This reflection works both ways, where she's interrogating her captors by appearing like she's the one being interrogated. I'm in the middle of an interrogation. This moron is giving me everything. I don't give everything. She's so adept at socialization that communication is like a game to her, where purpose is never obstructed by any ego. This is effectively where her arc properly begins. And your actress buddy, is she a spy too? They start that young? I did. Because Black Widow throughout the story is more relaxed. She's in her element now. S.H.I.E.L.D. is involved, so she feels morally confident. The villain is literally a mass murderer. He killed 80 people in two days. He's adopted. And she gets to work with the morally impeccable, like Steve and Tony. Yeah. Yeah. Is really that is naive? That S.H.I.E.L.D. So monitors potential threats. This is the character at home, and therefore marks the boundaries between the known and the unknown. And crossing this line is what Campbell described as destiny has summoned the hero. This path is marked out by Hawkeye and the Hulk, who maps out a fun continuity for what the familiar domain means for Natasha's reality. Monsters and magic and nothing we were ever trained for. Clint is like an anchor because whatever she did in the past and however unredeemable it was, he's her ideal self. He was willing to give her a second chance, so this is the soul logic that pins her world together. How many agents? Don't, don't do that to yourself, Clint. While Bruce resembles more of her own self-image, a lonely monster that was corrupted by an inner force. A moment that highlights this dynamic is when Bruce struggles from stopping himself from turning to the Hulk, and she swears to help him. She tries to give him what Clint gave her, but it fails. I swear on my life, I will get you out of Your life! And that failure momentarily immobilizes her, and it's something that is lingered on in the directing. Her anxiety with the Hulk is to an extent reflective of her fear of not having any redemption, that her identity is fixed and unmoving. He reflects something incredibly bleak back to her. I've seen worse. Sorry. No, we could use a little worse. Subsequently, Black Widow innately lives in a space where her sense of self feels extremely precarious. But her ability to fight regardless with the Avengers and to be the one that despite exhaustion closes the portal is the one thing that allows her to live in a world with such limited balance. Doing the job gives her a sense of gravity. In Winter Soldier, Black Widow is now finally forced to walk from the known into the unknown. The context that held her precarious world is now stripped away, not just by the Hydra twist, but also by Steve, who becomes her new reference point. He is what Campbell defined as the supernatural aid or the threshold guardian slash mentor figure who helps her along with her journey. He specifically said not infrequently the supernatural helper is masculine in form who appears to supply the amulets and advice that the hero will require. In this case, the amulet she's given is a new pair of eyes to see the world with. I guess I can't tell the difference anymore. There's a chance you might be in the wrong business. Because at the heart of the story is the tale of a sincere liar that is transformed by a man who struggles to deceive. That sounded a lot more poetic than I planned. The most crucial moment that encapsulates not only this epoch in her identity, but in her entire journey is from the intimate scene between her and Steve, where she asks him, If it was the other way around, and it was down to me to save your life, and you'd be honest with me, would you trust me to do it? I would now. It's a moment that mirrors her scene with Clint from the Avengers, but instead of looking for meaning in the past, she desperately consults the present. Steve totally didn't trust her because as much as he's charmed by her wit, he maintains a professional distance out of an old fashioned sense of courtesy. And she also represents everything he doesn't like about the new culture of fear. I didn't want you doing anything you weren't comfortable with. Agent Romanoff is comfortable with everything. I can't lead a mission when the people I'm leading have missions of their own. But it's by this sincerity that he gives her something that's deeply alien. And I'm always honest. Nat's precarious sense of balance is rebalanced because she's given hope, and because it isn't coming from Clint, but from Steve. Agent Romanoff? Captain Rogers. Ma'am? 
she's now given a sense of progression in time that exposes something new and exciting inside her. And that's what the ending of Winter Soldier celebrates, the beauty of this junction. Natasha is hopeful of her possibilities. She happily takes her steps into the new frontier. I blew all my covers. I gotta go figure out a new one. It might take a while. I'm counting on it. If you summarize Natasha's journey in her first set of appearances, this is a story about the struggle of disguise. She's a character who exists at foremost as a reflection. As a secretary for Tony, she's a mystique who can deceive others. As a superhero of the Avengers, she's a paragon that doesn't know it. She doesn't know she's deceiving herself. And as a liar turns truth seeker, she discovers a new world and a world to travel in it. She's excited to be honest with herself now, and so she finds a new entrance in life and enters it. Ordinarily in the second act of a story, the protagonist has to face a set of trials, pressures, and have to slay dragons and such. As Campbell said, the ordeal is a deepening of the problem of the first threshold, and question is still in balance. Can the ego put itself to death? For Natasha, this comes in the form of temptations. Black Widow is trying to shortcut the construction of her identity by pursuing a relationship with Banner. Because now that she has a new sense of interest in building a new life, falling in love with the Hulk is her re-evaluating the gap in her identity, between who she thinks she is against who she wants to be. And this is what's so interesting about Age of Ultron, despite the goofy humour, it's actually an incredibly nihilistic interrogation of these characters, because Clint's family is used to scrutinise each member of the Avengers. Clint has been expanded upon by not only representing an ideal self, but also an ideal life, which then is used to expose each character's connection with the future and what's ultimately relevant in their life if you strip everything away. Gentlemen, this is Laura. I know all your names. <laughs> Tony identifies with the smaller world and it's what he finds solace in. Steve has no connection because his happy ending was torn out of him the moment he sacrificed himself. And it's simply a reminder for Thor that he has a duty as a protector in spite of his own confusions and fears. But it's the most tragic for Black Widow because this is something she desperately wants but can't ever make tangible. Subsequently, this is where the Wanda visions come into place. These flashes are like different forms of punishments used to tear into the foundations of each character. For Steve, he sees a past that can never happen, that is, until Endgame. For Tony, he sees a future that can totally happen, until Endgame. And for Thor, he sees a future that is going to happen, and then did happen. We are all dead! Can you not see it? Aww. Natasha has a flash of her origins, but it's never clear enough to provide detailed events. Instead, it provides a feeling of how she felt. It's communicated as a form of trauma. And since I'm defining trauma for like the hundredth time, I might as well use Emily Kitely and Michael Pickering's essay, Trauma, Discourse and Communicative Limits, which said, For an individual suffering from traumatic experience, there is a marked difficulty, sometimes profound, in making the experience storyable and knowable. And that difficulty in communication for Nat is articulated by her connection with the Hulk, because his image as a monster is able to symbolise and externalise something that is difficult to put into words for her. How she sees herself versus how she sees Bruce is not really comparable, but that's the point. And this is where the body judgement scene lays its most important foundations, because it's Natasha at her most characteristically naked. She finds harmony with Banner because she hasn't let go of her own distorted reflection. They have a graduation ceremony. They sterilise you. It highlights that there's an entanglement of old logics against a new world, and the language she uses is evident of not only how trapped she is, but how uncommunicable her sense of time and identity are. You still think you're the only monster on the team? Therefore, Bruce Banner is a temptress, more or less, that's implicitly straying Natasha away from reconstructing her identity, because by just simply being around, he actively incentivizes her to orientate her imagination backwards fixed on a trapped meaning. Consequently, it's ironic that Bruce Banner leaving is actually the best thing that could have happened to her because she's forced to concentrate her efforts in constructing a new continuity, a new narrative that can contextualize her painful past into something usable in the present. And just as Steve mentored her in Winter Soldier, it's fitting that he's the one that leads her out with a joke. Staring at the wall or do you want to go to work? I mean, it's a pretty interesting wall. 
thought you and Tony were still gazing into each other's eyes. And into a new destination as the co-leader of the Avengers. She finds a new reflection from her sense of duty, purpose, which is a lesson that Steve himself learns, and is something that they now instill with the new Avengers. In this one moment, she's finally happy. Natasha's life is now at a stable place. While Steve and Tony are struggling with their lives, she's the only person operating at full capacity. She's the main representative of the Avengers. She's there for Steve during Peggy's funeral when she backs up Tony's attempt to keep the Avengers together. You all right? She's self-actualized to a large extent because the new identity that she's crafted is defined by her ability to hold on to hope. She even mentors her mentor. Mother, what are you doing here? I didn't want you to be alone. There is a point where the film flirts with the notion that her signing this Coven Accords and siding with Tony was her taking a shortcut, as she did with Bruce Banner, but the story rebukes this when she is technically the person who disbands the Avengers as we know it. She would rather have the Avengers fall apart than lose her grip with her own beliefs. In this case, friendship is more important than hubris. A scene that highlights this change in Natasha is her small confrontation with Tony before she leaves, which also makes for a fun comparison with the scene from Iron Man 2, because now the exchange isn't one way. On one hand, they're not just colleagues, they've developed into friends who can map out each other's thoughts in an argument. Oh, it must be hard to shake the double agent thing, huh? Sticks in the DNA. And on the other hand, her identity is not dependent on the reflection of someone else. It's not a performance. It's truly her and she can fight for it. Are you incapable of letting go of your ego for one goddamn second? This is what Campbell called the ultimate boon, where finally the mind breaks the bounding sphere of the cosmos to a realization transcending all experience of form. Age of Ultron and Civil War is a story of Nat leaving her cocoon, if you can take this sentimental metaphor seriously. It's her reconciling with her trauma by making new meaning with her new purpose in life, and that is ultimately her achieving the goal in her life. Someone who's not preoccupied with the past, nor anticipating the future, but can live in the present with a sense of freedom and assurance that was never felt before. In the third act of the story, there's ordinarily a stage where the hero has to come home and face the world as someone who's changed. Joseph Campbell presented this as crossing of the return threshold. In Infinity War, she returns to being the commander of the Avengers, side by side with Steve and Sam again, and her introduction is her jumping in, fighting for Wanda and Vision. Which on one hand makes for an awesome opening, but on the other hand, there's also some fun, implicit symbolisms embedded into it because Wanda and Visions are lovers trying to live and hide in a humble way, which was what Nat wanted to have with Bruce. Subsequently, having her save them and stabbing Corvus Glaive in the balls is a fun way to show how far she's come, which is further anchored when she simply has a smile for Bruce back in the compound. Before Nat faces the trouble of keeping her wisdom, we see her at her finest hour on the edge of the world, trying her best to save it, standing side by side in front of an army with a king and a historical figure, and charging headfirst against the bringer of death itself. In Endgame, Nat finds herself getting lost again, but interestingly, it's not from the snap, it's from Thanos' death. Because before she could focus her sense of duty on going after him, now that it's an official dead end with no possibilities whatsoever, her sense of relevance has been completely eroded. I used to have nothing, and then I got this. The sense of purpose that she found harmony in is torn away to the point that making a peanut butter sandwich is a miserable endeavor. Nat and Steve now share the same position in life. They've both shaped their sense of identities by a sense of connection with their craft. You know, I keep telling everybody they should move on and grow. Some do, but not us. If I move on, who does this? Maybe it doesn't need to be done. But where Steve is content with the snap because his sense of connection was always on shaky grounds ever since he was yanked out of time, the feeling of relevance is crucial for Nat's identity because her sense of continuity was founded on being an Avenger. As Campbell said, how render back into light world language the speech-defying pronouncements of the dark. 
Now that she can't avenge the fallen or even protect anyone, this new constructed identity has stopped being convincing. They're gone. I'm still trying to be better. Her sense of continuity is gone again. But subsequently she reawakens with the time heist and with helping Clint. Finally, her identity is planted back onto familiar grounds. She doesn't need him to reflect her identity back to her, instead she reflects something good for him. She becomes the moral reference for him as he did for her. I don't judge people on their worst mistakes. Maybe you should. You didn't. Subsequently, she has developed into a moral authority as opposed to always searching for one. But this also shows how she's a creature of war and conflict. Therefore, peace is trauma for her because it's so deeply unachievable and incompatible. So it's the natural end for the character that she chooses to sacrifice herself because this is the ultimate act of honesty she could make. Please no. It's okay. There's no deceptive intent whatsoever. When she's telling Clint that it's okay, she's staring at him right in the eyes. And for this one moment, it doesn't matter what he thinks of her, what matters is what she thinks of herself. And for the first time, she's proud. There's no moral precariousness. She knows she has absolutely redeemed herself, not in anyone else's eyes, but in her own. The fact that we never knew what were the terrible things that she did is now balanced by how we'll never really know how many lives she saved. The death is bleak, but unbelievably creatively honest. This is who the character is, and this is her limit. And by touching it, she becomes whole. Tony died to save the future, but Natasha died to restore the present. So Black Widow is all about the limits of human growth and the importance of discovering an individual sense of purpose. She shows us that the measurements for achievement is not defined in a world that reflects your successes back to you, but from the meaning that we make when we see our own reflections. And this power can only be sharpened not by projecting our loves onto something else in life, but from the willingness to accept a love for ourself. Not by vanity, but by closing a gap between what we are and what we can be. How many of these corny speeches have I made now? Black Widow, oddly enough from the entire Infinity Saga, benefited from not getting her own films because it allowed her journey to be more consistently creative, braver, and more emotionally provocative. Each film that she appears in unstrips the character's emotional layers so subtly that it's one of the most rewarding character arcs in the entire MCU. By being a supporting character for 10 years, she's able to use other characters and their arcs and journeys to paint a mosaic of her own complexities. One where purpose is a reflection that is constantly showing something different. And I think that's pretty cool. I had this, um, dream. The kind that seems normal at the time. But when you wake... What is your dream? That I was an Avenger. That I was anything more than the assassin they made me. She had family. 